let's open to the end of the book of Matthew. The reason we're going there is we're looking at the most frequently fulfilled prophecy for believers. It's the very last verse of Matthew. All of you know the beginning of it. It's called the great what? Commission. But the Great Commission ends with the greatest promise of all. It's a promise that Jesus made, and every time someone is born again, he fulfills that promise again. Now think about what this says, the last verse of Matthew, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, look at this, I am with you always. Jesus Christ promised And he keeps his word that he would be with each one of us always. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean just kind of this kind of distant sense that somewhere out there he is somewhere around? No. The scriptures tell us, and now let's go to the first chapter of Revelation, very specifically what it means that Jesus would be with us always. When Jesus is with us, some truths are unleashed in our lives. We see in verse 13 that Jesus with us, and we learned this this morning, is the risen and glorified Son of Man. That means Jesus with us is not Jesus out there, distant, unknowable, this infinite creator God, which he is. Remember, he is the creator and he is the infinite God, the Son. But he is God, the Son, the Son of Man. And so it says there that one like the Son of Man. So he can truly have compassion on us. That's what that's all about. That idea that he knows our frame, he knows our weakness, and that's why his most frequent emotion is compassion. He is moved within. He literally, it says in the the Bible that, that he was moved physically, emotionally, when he saw people. Do you realize how much love Jesus Christ has for each one of us? I mean, he is moved with compassion for you and for me. That's how much he loves us. That's how much he longs for us to realize he's with us as a son of man. Secondly, we saw he's with us as our perfect high priest. Uh, If you look at verse 13 of uh, the second half of it, it says there that he was clothed with this garment down to the feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. This is our risen and glorified priest. And this is, I reference with you what it says in Hebrews 7, 24, that he, because he continues forever, that's the whiteness, speaking of his eternality, that's what the whole picture, which is drawn, by the way, from uh, the book of Daniel, chapter 7, it's the same picture of Jesus, showing him as the ancient of days, the endless one. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood, and that's what that robe to the feet and the, the golden sash is all about. He is our ever living to make intercession for us priest now think about that if you're a parent you know what it's like if you love your children and they're in need you'll do anything for them I remember recently and uh, I think it was at Christmas time that the flights for the kids coming from the east out here to Tulsa uh, were delayed and ice storms and they called and they said our flight's been canceled and immediately mom got on the phone and by her calling the airline she was able to arrange another flight and right then when they told them all to come up to the desk they walked to another counter and just checked in and actually left and I thought about how it was that intercession of a loving individual, a mother for those that she loved, her children that made such a smooth transition do you realize how much more powerful is your heavenly high priest intercession he ever lives Think, in fact you ought to turn back there we're going to have to leave Revelation anyway look at, at Hebrews 7 because sometimes we Hebrews is a hard book So we kind of zip through it. This says something very big. It says Jesus, right now, Hebrews 7, 24 and 25, ever lives to make intercession for us. Now some people live 
for golf. Some people live for money. Some people live for whatever pleasure. Some people live restlessly. You can characterize someone. Some people just live to work. Some people live to eat. You know, I mean, there's things we say. Do you know what Jesus lives for? I mean, without exaggerating, the Bible says Jesus ever lives to intercede for us. Now we already know from 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6, that there's one God and one mediator, one intercessor, one go-between, between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is always representing us to the Father. And that is what his intercessory work is all about. Now we are so needy that he is not alone in that intercessory work. Also, it says in Romans 8, that the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that are unutterable. They are unutterable groanings. He, he is so longing to see Christ formed in us. He is interceding for us. You didn't know that Christian life was so hard, did you? It, it's just kind of a consuming thing just to want to obey and love him. But we've got the Holy Spirit making intercession for us. And we have Jesus who, chapter 7, therefore he saves us to the uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Kind of exciting, isn't it? To know that you have a 24-7 link to God who is ever living to represent us. That's why it's, it's so exciting to grow in this awareness of what Jesus Christ is doing. He said, I'm with you. What does that mean? It means I have compassion for you. I'm with you to the end of your life. I feel for you. What else does it mean? It means that I'm your heavenly high priest. I'm ever interceding for you. Now, Dr. Barnhouse, the great... 10th Presbyterian Church of Philadelphia, pastor for many years, editor of Eternity Magazine, and a tremendous Bible expositor, said something interesting once. He said, prayer changes nothing but me. The more you think about it, the Holy Spirit's prayers are perfect. Jesus Christ's intercession for us is perfect. Who's the one that's out of kilter? It's us. And prayer is me longing to be in unison, in concert, in step with, and walk with the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and the Son of God being formed in me. That's the mystery of the Christian life, how patient God is. How interceding Jesus Christ is before the Father for us. Because he wants to see us conform to him. So when Jesus said, lo, I am with you always, he says, lo, I'm with you always. I have compassion on you. Lo, I'm with you always. I'm interceding for you. The third one we saw is at the end of verse 14, his eyes like the flame of fire. He can truly see us wherever we are. He is the one who is watching. Now remember, there's two kinds of watching. I told you about the baby nursery and the glass there. There are the observers, and then there are the rescuers that actually go to the needy one and do something. And they don't just push their face against the glass and observe. They're actually there. And that's what Jesus does. And we saw that. His eyes of fire not only can penetrate through all the storms of our life, all the darkness, all the clouds, all the the, difficulty we're going through and just the dust that goes around our lives, but he sees through where we are, but he doesn't stop there. He comes to us. And you know what's interesting, and and I was referencing um, Jesus on our bell, that's Mark 6, 46 to 48, but Jesus came, listen, save you three thousand dollars okay because this is the main lesson you learn in israel so you can just sit there for free and get it jesus always came to the disciples across their storms across their problems you know what we do we avoid problems we don't like conflict we don't like difficulties we don't like cancer we don't like sickness we don't like being unemployed we don't like going through hard times with our children but you know what Jesus Christ meets us in our storms, in our weaknesses, in our, our being at the end of ourselves. Those are the best times. That's when 
That's not just when he's closest. That's when we get to experience him. He couldn't get closer than he is. It's just we're aware of it when we're in trouble, when we're struggling. And so Jesus, those eyes of fire, remind us that he, and as long as you're in Hebrews, go back to chapter 4, the last verse of chapter 4. What does Jesus do now? Jesus, who always knows where his disciples were back then and what they needed, what does he do for us now? Do you remember the whole idea of this prophecy, lo, I am with you always, is that we're looking at what Jesus did. Then we see what he promised he would do in the book of Revelation. And when those two link up, we realize what he's doing what? Now. When? Now. In our lives. What is he doing now? It says in Hebrews 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, Jesus doesn't push his grace on us. He lavishes it. He pours it out on us. But you know what? We have to receive. We have to accept. We have to invite and welcome and allow him to pour that out upon us in our time of need. He doesn't force himself on us. That's what's interesting. We're going to see a little bit later in another one of these. In Revelation 3 and verse 20, when Jesus is talking to the church in Laodicea, and he says, I'm standing at the door and what? Knocking. Now, the the famous uh, painting that was painted of this, Holman Hunt painted the painting that's still in the British Art Gallery. It's one of the most beautiful paintings of the Bible. And it shows Jesus rapping against this door. That's, That's all it is. He's got his head there and he's listening. And you can see him knocking on the door. And the curious thing about the picture is there's no what? There's no handle on the outside. He's... He's wanting in to bring us, look at verse 16, this mercy and grace to help in time of need. He's he's wanting to commune with us in our storm. He's waiting. And yes, yes, sometimes we're totally oblivious to need and it's true that, that he does come to our rescue when we don't even need it. But I'm talking about in general everyday life, Jesus is waiting for us to invite him in. To give us the wisdom we need, to give us the strength we need, to give us the insight, to give us the, the bigger picture so we aren't just down here in our little tempest in our teapot so we see his larger program and cooperate with him. But he, through those eyes of fire who knows every detail, every fear, every weakness, can help us. That's what Jesus wants to do. Well, what is need is, and I want you to go back to uh, Mark 6. Mark chapter 6, verse 46, because I want to show you one more aspect of Jesus Christ in his risen and glorified perfection. Mark chapter 6. We're looking at the fourth element. If you're writing these down, we need to see Christ risen and glorified omnipotence. Because when Jesus comes with this help, it's, it's almost like some of the funny things that we experience in media. There are a lot of people that promise help. They say, oh, I'll give you this, I'll give you this. And especially all the crazy ads you get, you know, that, that if you do this on the internet, you know, that, that it'll cure this or it'll cure that or you'll triple or quadruple your money. You know, they are all these empty promises that can never happen. But the fourth facet of Jesus Christ promising to be with us is that he is omnipotent. If he promises, he can do it. And that's what we see here when it says in Mark chapter 6 and verse 46, it says, uh, he sent them away, they departed. 47, the evening came, the boat was in the middle. Verse 48, he saw them, that's his eyes, that's his omniscience. Now, at the middle of verse 48, now about the fourth watch of the night, You know what the fourth watch of the night is? The first watch went from six to nine. The second watch went from nine to 12. The third watch went from 12 to three. The fourth watch was at 3 a.m. It was still light out when Jesus sent them in the boat. It was probably six. And Jesus let them Paddle, 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 paddle. First watch, three hours. He let them paddle, 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 and worry, worry, worry. He, second watch. He let them think they were sinking, 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 and drowning, drowning, drowning. Third watch. Look down at verse 48. Now about the fourth watch of the night. Now we don't usually have patience for what God is doing. 
this past summer I was speaking at a um, Go Lake in, in, uh, in Michigan and the kids found a butterfly that was starting to come out of its cocoon. It was a, a monarch, and it was beautiful, and you could see, you know, it was straining, and, and it was pushing and doing whatever they do, and all of a sudden you could just see the glint of those white spots and that beautiful black and orange background of a monarch. And so I said, now children, let it go. It's supposed to do this itself. And so I went away, and I was studying and working on my computer, and I came back, and they said, it's done, look. And they brought this crumpled up, you know, still was an unfurled monarch. And you know what? They had helped it out. And what they didn't know is that part of a butterfly having those beautiful extended wings is it has to labor, 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 and push and do all the things it does. And that somehow extends its wings and, and makes them all come out. Because that little monarch never got, it died. It was, it was like a, a folded up parachute. It never did its thing. And you know what? If Jesus Christ, look at what's happening. He sent them away in verse 46, and he departed in the mountain to pray. And then evening came. He sent them off before dark, before the first watch. And then evening came. And he went up there and was on that mountain, and he was interceding for them, and he was watching them. Now, he never let that temptation be too great. He never let them despair completely of life. He never let them get to a point where... Like Satan was trying to sift Peter, but Jesus said, I'm not going to let him. See, he knows our frame. He knows how much we can take. But Jesus knew this. Look look what he says. He saw them, verse 48, straining at rowing. The wind was against them, but he waited until the what? Fourth watch. You know what that means? He let them go over nine hours. Thinking they were sinking, thinking they were dying, thinking they would never make it, thinking they'd never see their families again. Why? I mean, how cruel could that be? Yeah, it's like how cruel it is for that monarch butterfly to have to struggle for a whole day to get out of its chrysalis or whatever you call that thing it was in. If someone tears it and cuts it and helps it, it ruins it. Jesus knows what we need and he ever lives to intercede for us but watch what happens after this intercession in the fourth watch of the night he came to them look at this walking on the sea now I love this he didn't fly he didn't drop down I mean, wouldn't it have been neat, a big ray of light and shining on the, on the storm tossed sea and he descended like this you know And he came walking Look what it says, walking on the sea. What was it that was giving them the problem? It wasn't the boat, it wasn't the night, it was the storm, the water, the sea. And Jesus walked with his feet across the sea, the storm, the problem, what it was that was going to drown them. He walked with his what? Feet. What element does John see of Jesus Christ? First he saw he was like the son of man. Then he saw this robe. And then the first thing is he, as he's looking at him, he saw those eyes. And then, must be they were so awesome to him, he averted his gaze and he looked down and he sees his feet. And this is what it says. His feet were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace. And those feet of brass, that's the fourth element we're looking at, speaks of strength and power. And Jesus reveals that strength to remind us. He is omnipotent. And those feet of brass, of power, of omnipotence, walked across. In fact, I love the, you know, I've read a lot of children's storybooks because I've had a lot of children's uh, to read to. And I love the little, one of the little storybooks we read that shows every time Jesus takes a step, the water gets calm. And he walked across that water going, and he got up by the boat. You see, Jesus is omnipotent. His feet of brass. He came, Mark 6, verse 48, walking to them. But what's interesting was, and this is another lesson, he would have what? What does verse 48 say? He would have gone right by. But what did they do? They cried out to him. Jesus wants to be invited into our lives. Do you know what it says in James? And we won't turn there. We'll get totally lost tonight. It says, you have not because you what? 
Ask not. How many things in our life do we not even invite the Lord into? And how many things do we miserably fail in and look back and say, oh, I wish I hadn't made that terrible mistake. That was a terrible deal I got in. That was a terrible partnership. That was a terrible judgment. That was a terrible purchase. How often does he come to us across our storm and he walks right by? Because what? We don't, we don't cry out to him and say, help us. See, that's, do you realize that's what this, every detail is in the Bible for a reason. He is showing us that they're in that storm and they needed to cry out to him. Maybe he waited for nine hours just for them to get to the point where they would cry out to him instead of thinking they could do it themselves. I don't know. I don't want to add too much to this, but that is an interesting little detail. He was going to pass them by. In the lesson in Matthew 20 about the two blind men, it was told to them that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. He wasn't there. He was just going by. And they were blind, and they didn't know how far away he was. They didn't know when he was coming. They just heard in the crowd that Jesus of Nazareth was on the Jericho Road going up to Jerusalem. And so do you remember what Bartimaeus did? It says he screamed out at the top of his voice. He got up, and he just started blindly walking because he didn't want to miss Jesus passing by. Right here in chapter 6 in verse 49, when they saw him walking in the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and they cried out, for they all saw him were troubled, but immediately he talked with them and said to them, be of good cheer, it's I, don't be afraid. Jesus wanted to come to them across the storm, across their problem, and demonstrate his omnipotence. Well, there are, there are many other uh, examples of this, but let me take you to 1 Corinthians ten thirteen, And this is, uh, for me, this is Jesus coming on every storm that I face. 1 Corinthians ten thirteen. you probably have it memorized, but turn there anyway. If you don't, you should have it marked at least. What does Jesus do now? If Jesus on earth was always delivering them from danger and was stilling all their storms, Okay, remember what we're looking at, what was 2,000 years ago. And then what did John see? He saw those omnipotent feet. What does that mean to us? How do, how do we transfer from just a good Sunday school lesson with all the facts, man, all the facts? How do we get to tonight? 1 Corinthians ten thirteen. There is no temptation. No temptation has overtaken you. Isn't that interesting? overtaken you that means temptations chasing us until we are in the grave i mean from salvation onward we're especially chased by all these temptations where our our flesh is just trying to ruin everything and it's trying to come up behind us and trip us up temptation is james tells us this but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed you're tempted to the proportion that you are feeding your lusts That's why you can have less and less temptations the more you grow in Christ, if you're starving that thing. Remember my story I've told you so many times about Bonnie's sourdough thing that she used to keep in the back of our refrigerator until I spilled it one too many times and we don't have it anymore? But she kept that rotting, whatever it was, that smelled so horrible, and she'd pull that out, take the lid off, leave it on the counter, feed it sugar. That thing never died. She was always feeding it. I meet people all the time, and they say, oh, oh, I'm just struggling with this lust here, and I'm just struggling with that lust there. When I listen to them, I know what God is telling us in his word. They are struggling always at the same level because they are putting sugar into the container. If you struggle with any less, if you're you're materialistic and struggle with materialism, then quit feeding it. Don't watch the Home Shopping Network and subscribe to all those magazines and walk them all all the time and get all those catalogs. If you are struggling with the lust of flesh, don't feed it. If you're struggling with anxiety about money, don't feed it. It always, he says here, no temptation has overtaken you as such as is common. And you won't be tempted unless you're first drawn away of your own lust and enticed. But then when lust hath conceived, what does that mean? Our lusts that are always with us which are fed or mortified to varying degrees, are drawing our flesh. So our lust is drawing our flesh, but there's another element, our will. When lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. When the flesh and that lust can keep talking to our will until we say, all right, just once, just once, only once, I'm going to do that. 
and we give in. Lust conceives and brings forth sin. Sin is when we yield willfully to the temptation. Temptation is not sin. Temptation is just a reflection of the strength of our lust, how much we've fed it. That's why the mature Christian is mortifying. They're constantly saying no and starving and killing and putting to death all that. But what happens when you haven't had time to mortify that? Look back at verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation has overtaken you. It's always chasing us, except such as common to man. We always know where it's going to come. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. There are only three channels. Kind of reminds me of growing up. We only had three channels on TV. Any of you remember those days? There were just three channels. You know, ABC, NBC, and CBS. That was it. And then there was the UHS one, that, or UHF, that always was wiggling. But there were three channels. Well, there are only three channels in the spiritual world. Temptation is going to come either on this channel, lust of the flesh, which is fulfilling a legitimate desire in an illegitimate way, or lust of the eyes, that's that constant, you know, the, the finer things, or the pride of life. The clap, the accolade, the arrogance. But there's only three channels. And what he's saying here is, when one of those three comes, God is faithful. This is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Jesus said, every believer that's ever saved and everyone who ever comes to know me, from this point onward, I will always be with them. How is he with us? Son of man feels with compassion. The great high priest wearing that robe, he's always ready to forgive our sins and not condemn us and cleanse us. And then those eyes, he always knows where we are and he's always right there knowing exactly what we need. And those feet, those feet of omnipotence. You know what Martin Luther used to say? He says, when the devil knocks with temptation, I send Jesus to answer the door. And Jesus says, yes. The devil says, I'm coming for Martin Luther. And Jesus says, Martin doesn't live here anymore. I do. Now, wasn't Luther a simplistic guy? Yes. And he knew the power of sin. And he said that there's no temptation that is going to overtake me, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow us to be tempted beyond what you're able. But, verse 13 says, will with the temptation always make the way of escape. What is the way of escape? Have you thought about what it is? It's the one with the omniscience, the eyes of piercing fire, who comes right to where we are in our boat and says, this way is the way of escape. And I am all powerfully able to make a way for you to escape that sin. You don't have to commit it. You don't have to yield to that temptation. You don't have to feed your lust. You don't have to. Uh, Constantly I share when I'm discipling the people I disciple. I say every time you choose to get angry, you're feeding that. It's going to get bigger. Every time you choose to be impatient, you're feeding that. It's going to get bigger. Every time you choose to give in to your lust, you're feeding that. It's going to get bigger and stronger and more, more tenaciously holding you. But every time we let... The exit sign, Jesus Christ saying, I'm faithful, I'm omnipotent, my feet of brass, I've come with the power to deliver you. Every time we say yes to him, then we gain the precious fulfillment of his promise. He would be with us, he'll make a way and an exit door for us and escape. Plus we show he's faithful because he promised that when he's with us, he will cause us to be led in triumph. Jesus is always there. His omnipotent feet of brass are always able to deliver us. We sometimes just don't want to be led. And we have to admit that. We love our sin sometimes. We, we kind of have these close ones that we just need. Kind of like we call them our pet you know, areas. And the Lord says, no, I want you to give... All of them. That's what the book, the famous book, My Heart, Christ's Home, is all about. About giving every room, have no locked doors in our lives that we don't give up to him. That's what Jesus wants to do. Okay, uh, let's go now to John chapter 20 and verse 13. Let me show you the fifth one. And what we're looking at now is the fifth perfect facet, Christ risen and glorified. Listen omnipresence. We've looked at son of man. That's his compassion. We've looked at the priesthood, his perfect priesthood. Then we've looked at those eyes. That's his omniscience. Then we've looked at his omnipotence, those feet. And now listen to what John sees. The voice like the sound of many waters. Have you ever noticed Jesus was always speaking to people at their time of greatest need? His voice cuts right through. Just like we just saw. When they were thinking... 
And I didn't even take you to all of them. There were more than one boat story. Jesus was always rescuing in the boats. Remember one time he was asleep? You remember that one? And another time he's walking and he asked Peter to walk on the water. See, there's a lot of boat deals, three specific different ones. But each time he speaks and it goes right across and just at the right time they hear him. John chapter 20, let me show you what I mean. Verse 13, and then they said to her, that says the resurrection morning, that's the angels, woman, why are you weeping? You know, I don't think she caught the question because she had to be asked again by Jesus, but she catches it the second time. And she said to them, because they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they have laid him. Verse 14, now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and didn't know it was Jesus. Verse 15, now here is the voice of Jesus like the sound of many waters that is always present when we need to hear him. And here is his voice. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? See, that's what she needed to hear. You see, she stayed last at the cross and was first at the tomb because she had a self-professed need of Jesus. And Jesus comes to those who need him. I mean, can you keep a mother from a crying baby that that mother loves and feels for that child? Can you keep a mother away? There's nothing worse than this training the kids to to learn they can't get their away and letting them cry. I mean, mothers just go, you know, they just can't stand it. They want to run and rescue that child, which is selfish and bellowing and trying to get its own way. Now, sometimes they really do have a problem, but often they don't, you know, and so you got to discern that. Well, look at Mary. Jesus is responding to her because her weeping was saying, I need Jesus. And listen to him. And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And verse 16, there's the voice. And Jesus said to her one word, Mary. Now you know already what it says in chapter 10, and here's the fulfillment of that. It says, my sheep, what? Hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. I'm so glad the Lord said that. Because sometimes we can't tell who the sheep are and who aren't. You know what I mean? It's hard. But Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And they respond to me. And so that voice, it's like the sound of many waters, is, is that omnipresent voice that we can hear in our time of need. And I want to tell you that no matter where you are, uh, whether you're at your last moment and you're just in that darkness just before you leave this planet and you're in the hospital or, or trapped in your car or wherever, you will hear his voice. And if before that time you're sitting quietly with this book open and you say, I need you, you will hear his voice. Why? Because he says, lo, I am what? I am with you always. And I am omnipresently there. And and you will hear my voice and I will speak to you. My sheep hear my voice. And they know me and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they can never perish. Well, Chapter 21, let's look at another person who had a great need, Peter. Well, look what Jesus says in 2115. Because that really, that was very well portrayed because that was Peter's problem. If Peter didn't get that resolved, he could have never gone forward for the Lord. And he needed to hear the voice of the Lord. He needed to to hear that risen and glorified voice like the sound of many waters. That Jesus always spoke to people in their time of greatest need. His voice can be heard anywhere because he is everywhere present. And he truly wants to speak to us to give us the strength we need. What, did, what strength did Mary need? She needed to believe what she knew. She knew he promised that he would rise again. She just didn't believe it. And when he said, Mary, she believed. And had a wonderful worship time. Look at verse 15. Now when they'd eaten breakfast, 2115, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said, Feed my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. Verse 17. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? 
And Peter was grieved because it was three times. Everything in threes bothered him because he couldn't forget. It just was such a deep wound. Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. What is all that about? Peter needed Jesus to back him out. If Jesus just said one time, Peter said, well, did he really mean it? If he just said it twice, he says, well, I'm not sure. But they, he knew that Jesus was tracking with him. He said, Peter, I knew that you denied me three times, and I just want you to tell me you love me three times. And I want you to know that this thing is all taken care of. And I promised you that after, after my resurrection, that you would be the one that would strengthen the brethren. Peter just needed to hear that voice personally. What is Jesus doing today? Well, Jesus tells us, I will never leave you or forsake you. He has told us that he'd be with us to the end of the age, Hebrews 13, 5. For he himself said, I will never leave you or forsake you. We need to hear his voice. And when you feel like you're giving in, when you feel like you're ready to quit, when you feel like it's too much and when you can't take it anymore, when, when you just say, I just doubt your promises, just say, Lord, I need to hear your voice. And you know what the Lord does? He speaks to us. And puts on our heart those words that we have heard from his word. He just brings them back anew and afresh. And we say, yes, I will believe you. Yes, I'm forgiven. Yes, I'm cleansed. Yes, you'll never condemn me. Yes, you're my great high priest. Yes, you have compassion for me. Yes, you see where I am and always come to me. Yes, you have those feet of omnipotence and you can solve and come across my storms. And yes, I can hear your voice. And he speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet, it calms wherever we are. Real quickly, we have time for the next one. Uh, Turn to Matthew 14, verse 33 with me, because I want to show you the sixth one. And if you're tracking on your list, the sixth one is, we need to see Christ risen and glorified majesty. Uh, We're going back to the boat again, another uh, walking on the water situation. And in 14, Jesus walks in the sea, starting in verse 22. And look, look what uh, happens when Jesus gets there in verse 33. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. What did Jesus always do? Let's, let's do our little thing over again. What did Jesus always do during his earthly ministry? He always did these huge events which caused everyone to go, oh! And then after they went, they looked at him and they went, that means you're God. And they started bowing down. And Jesus always did these big things to invite their worship. Okay? So that's what he did in his ministry. What did Jesus do here with John? John saw his face like the sun shining in its strength. And when John saw that, he crumbled in overwhelming, worshipful reverence and just fell down at Christ's feet. That was the desired response. That's what Jesus wanted. You see, all the way through his ministry, he, he moved all the fish in the Sea of Galilee into the net. And, and Peter says, get away from me. I'm, I'm a, a dirty man. I don't want to be near you. I know who you are. Jesus calmed the sea and they went, oh, God is in our boat. Jesus healed and raised to life and put eyes in and did all those other things. And you know what the people did? They were in wonder and worshiped him. So that's what he did. So John saw it. And he worshiped. So there's the Sunday school lesson. How do we do that today? Well, look at Luke 24, okay? I want to show you, after the resurrection, the response when Jesus was gone that we should mirror. Luke 24, the end of the book, verse 52, almost the last verse. What does Jesus do now? Jesus, who always was inviting worship to those who loved him back then, who was inviting it on the island of Patmos 65 or 60 plus years after his resurrection, is still waiting for us to crumble in awesome, reverent worship before him. Look at verse 52 of Luke 24. This is after Jesus 
Well, I'll go back to 50. And he led them out as far as Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he's still lifting up his hands and, and has this hands over them, blessing them. It says he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. So Jesus left. Can you imagine the last thing they saw is, is Jesus going up out of sight with his hands like this, you know, lifted up, blessing them like this. Now, isn't that a detail that we don't think about very much? He's just saying, I just want to pour out my blessing on you. I just want to give you everything you need, and I just want you to just know that that's doing. And I want the last thing you think about when you remember seeing me go is, and he's going off in the distance. Okay? That's another awesome moment. What response? He's carried up into heaven. Look at verse 52. And they worshiped him. And returned to Jerusalem. They went back. They didn't go to to some distant place. They went home. See, that's what worship does. It doesn't take us off to mountaintops where we live this unreal life, you know, in a monastery somewhere. We go back into our real world and look what it gives us. With great joy and continually in the temple they were praising and blessing God. That's what worship does. That's why Jesus said, do you remember in his temptation, Matthew 4, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. We have it all mixed up in the 21st century. We serve God and hope we get around to worship. And most of the time we don't. And he said, no, 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 no. Worship me first. Before you serve in the nursery, worship me. Then your service in the nursery will be joyous and full of thanksgiving. Before you teach that class, worship me. And then when you teach that class, you'll be full of joy and thanksgiving. Uh, Worship me first before you give that gift. Because if you give the gift, then you think, well, I'm not sure they're doing what they want to do with that. What did they do with that gift? No, he says, worship me and then do that service. See, we... We get it mixed up. And that's why so often we miss the great joy, the continuous praising and the blessing of God. What Jesus wants is he's waiting for us to lavish our loving worship on him. And I can give you lots more verses. Here's the last one. The last time that that we see Jesus in Revelation in this vision of John, it says he put his right hand on me. Because John was down there worshiping, but he was just totally without strength because it was just an overwhelming moment and Jesus touched him and gave him strength. You see this happening all the time. Daniel, uh, others, the Lord lifts him up. Ezekiel. Jesus was always touching those he loved with strength and help. Jesus was in the touching business 2,000 years ago. 60 years after the resurrection, putting his hands on John, touching him. Guess what Jesus is still doing? Can you connect it? He's touching those in time of need that ask for his help. Jesus wants to be needed. As a father, I love to give my children what they want. I ask them, what can I do for you? How can I help you? What would you like? I love to do things that please my wife. And I am frail and sinful and fallen and human. How much more will your heavenly father give you good gifts, Jesus said, to those who seek, those who knock, those who are characterized by asking. Have you met the risen Christ? Do you see him as the compassionate son of man? Have you seen him as that that forgiving, cleansing, and not condemning high priest? Have you seen him as that always seeing you and omnisciently knowing everything about you? Eyes of fire. Do you see those feet of brass as he is omnipotently coming with the strength, with the power to meet us in whatever storm we're in? Do you see that or hear that voice like the sound of many waters that has that omnipresence? He is always able to talk to us in any situation. Do you see him as he wants to be so full of majesty that we crumble before him and worship him? And then do you feel that touch of his hand? That's what the risen Christ wants to do because he said, Lo, just like I was, just like I am, I want to always be with you, always. 
I hope that this will be more than another nice little lesson. I hope that you will invite Jesus Christ into every part of your life and say, Risen Christ, see me, come to me. I bow before you, touch me. I need you. Let's bow before the Lord. Father in heaven, I pray that this beautiful, glorious picture that John saw of you, O risen Christ, would be burned onto our hearts and that we would willfully choose to meet you, risen Christ, every day, all through each day, until you come or call. We love you and worship you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.